themselves, especially. So do you, do you think that there will be any Democrats that might vote to save McCarthy? I mean, I, I, I certainly don't think that uh, we would expect to see that unless there's a real conversation between the Republican and Democratic caucuses and Republican and Democratic leadership about what that would mean. But I don't think we give up votes for free. And do you, but would you vote to vacate? Would you vote to get rid of McCarthy as would speaker? Would I cast that vote? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Kevin McCarthy is a very weak speaker. Uh, he clearly has lost control of his caucus. He has brought the United States and millions of Americans to the brink, waiting until the final hour uh, to, to um, keep the government open, and even then only issuing a 45-day ex extension. So we're going to be right back in this place in November. And, uh, you know, I think that our main priority has to be the American people and what's going to keep our, our governance in a cohesive and strong place. But unless Kevin McCarthy asks for a vote, again, I don't think we give something away for free. Yeah, I mean, I've heard your fellow squad member, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, say Democrats should only support uh, McCarthy in exchange for a 50-50 power-sharing agreement. Well, I mean, I, I think when it comes to power-sharing, we will discuss that as a caucus and what we would finally uh, accept or not. But again, it's going to, it comes at a price. You don't just vote for a Republican speaker for nothing. That's not what we're elected here to do. We're elected here to make sure that we raise the minimum wage to a living wage, to make sure that we cap the prices of prescription drugs, and to make sure that we work for working class Americans. Um, what's your take on what just happened, on, on the, the threat of a government shutdown and just the whole experience? Well, I think the Republican Party right now is completely out of step with the American people. And what we saw today and what we saw this week leading up to this final hour, you know, compromise, not even a compromise, but really capitulation by the Republican Party, we saw them go through every single possible iteration of cutting, cutting benefits. They tried to cut across the board 30% mm -hmm. uh, of the budgets of in critical agencies like the Social Security Administration. They, they voted, some of the mo most moderate members, quote unquote moderate members of the Republican Party, casted votes for things like 80% cuts under the Department of Education to low income schools. This is not a moderate party period. There are not moderates in the Republican Party. There are just different degrees of fealty to Donald Trump. Uh, but it starts with a lot of fealty, and then it goes to extreme fealty. Uh, and so we saw them go through every single iteration, walk through e into every single wall, kind of run around the house like a Roomba, and until they found a door that House Democrats opened, they finally realized that we should not shut down the government in order to deny trans service members the ability to get health care, in order to deny female service members the ability to get an abortion. And, you know, they filed an extension for 45 days until we're back in here. So let me just ask you about the larger issue. I'm not going to disagree with your description of them walking into walls, but the issue of the of federal spending, because as a fa just as a factual matter, the U.S. government spends more money than we take in. Now, whether you think we should cut spending or whether you think we should take in more through higher taxes, it just the books are not balanced, mm -hmm. right? And the national debt is $33 trillion. Mm -hmm. Matt Gates said that. That was correct. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. spent $475 billion last year just on interest payments on the debt, $475 billion. That's more money than went to food stamps. Mm -hmm. That is obviously money that could be better spent than on interest payments. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's more money than went to food stamps and temporary assistance for needy families and federal disability benefits and the earned income tax credit and the children's health insurance program combined, all of that combined. So it's a colossal waste of money, mm -hmm. and it would be better if we got our fiscal, ship, uh, fiscal house in order. Don't you agree with that? And isn't, isn't there a progressive case to be made about trying to balance the budget. Absolutely, and I, I vociferously disagree with any assertion that progressivism is somehow incompatible with fiscal responsibility. Progressivism believes in making investments that actually have returns. It means investing in education so that people are actually able to participate in an economy that will pay higher wages, which also in turn yields to higher revenues. It also means taxing the rich. We have billionaires out here that are 
that are also in turn lobbying in order to increase the amount of income inequality in this country. And when you have the degree of people who are not paying taxes um, and in the excess of wealth that we're seeing, of course we're going to uh, end up in a place of, uh, of deficit and, and debt. Additionally, when you see what Republicans did earlier this year by taking and playing games with our national debt ceiling and debt limit, you're also playing games with the credit rating of the United States of America, which could also yield much different terms in terms of repayment, interest, et cetera, increasing the layouts and payments that you just described. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, the reason I ask is because I don't hear Democrats or progressives talk about the need to reduce the deficit, reduce the debt as often as a vote, as a, me as a voter, as, a, as an independent voter, as much as I would like. And it's, it's an interesting point, and I think that we can draw those dots for sure. But really, when we talk about taxing the rich, we're talking about getting our house in order and our, our fiscal and our financial house in order as well. Because there's a lot of people out there who are not paying the bill. And instead of paying that bill, what they're doing is that they're taking folks like Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas on private jets in order to help facilitate additional rulings that only aggregate to their wealth. So we absolutely have an, oligop olig an oligarchy problem in this country. And that's where you're really going to find the line item to balance the books so that kids can go to school and so that we can make Make sure that we make progress on things like guaranteed health care in the United States of America. There was an interesting moment uh, over the weekend when your New York colleague, Congressman Jamal Bowman, and he's under investigation for this now after Capitol Police say he pulled a fire alarm mm -hmm. in one of the House office buildings. Democrats were trying to delay a vote, a final vote on the bill. Uh, there he is uh, pulling the fire alarm. He says it was an accident. He thought pulling the alarm would open a door. Uh, based on the fact that the doors to his right there were locked and there was a sign that he said he was, con I think someone said it was confusing. I I'll be honest, uh, it doesn't really make sense to me, his explanation. Have you talked to him? W w yeah. What's going on? There? I mean, listen, I think if you actually do see some of the photos of the signs, I think there's, there's something to be said about the government's about to shut down, there's a vote clock that's going down, the exits that are normally open in that building were suddenly closed. So he, you pulled a fire alarm? So I'm, I'm, what I am here to say is that House administration and U.S. Capitol Police and Jamal Bowman are inactive and he's fully participating in saying there was a misunderstanding. But what I do think is important to raise is the fact that Republicans, representatives like Nicole Maliotakis and others, immediately moved to file motions to censure, motions to expel, before there, before there has even been conversations that are that are finished to even see if there was a misunderstanding here. But what they did do, while they did that, what they did not do was to commit to the same when George Santos was actually found guilty after a thorough investigation of 13 federal charges. He's indicted on everything from wire fraud to actual lying of, of House investigators. And they have been buddying up and giggling with him on the House floor, and they are protecting someone who has lied to the American people, lied to the United States House of Representatives, lied to congressional investigators, but they're fire, uh, filing a motion of, to expel a member who, in a moment of panic, was trying to escape a vestibule? Give me a break. And so the idea that there is somehow any kind of equivalence to someone who is actively trying to clear up a situation that he himself admits he's embarrassed, he released a statement last night, he apologized, and they are protecting someone who has not only committed wire fraud, not only defrauded veterans, not only lied to congressional investigators, but is openly gloating about it, is absolutely humiliating to the Republican caucus. And I think that they should really check their own values. There's another Republican who's been indicted also that they've been defending, but we, yes, we don't... I, but we don't have the time to go into all of those okay. uh, charges, 91 of them. Congresswoman uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. It's good to see you.